Hello, hello. This is my season two of Comedy Nerd. I'm so excited that you're here listening to my podcast. Um, We're on Apple Music and on Spotify. And if you're listening to us on there, please consider giving us a review, um, telling your friends. This is a brand new podcast, so I'm, I'm just building it. Any help is much appreciated. And also, if you want to uh, find out about my shows, I'm on ra- at rachelelli.com. This is my conversation with comedian Martha Chavez. She's originally from Nicaragua. She's been working in Canada for the last, she's been working in comedy for the last 25 years. She's done just about everything you can in Canada and uh, she's awesome. So hope you enjoy this conversation and thanks for coming out to Comedy Nerd. Can't stop, won't stop. Can't stop, won't stop. Hello. Hello. There we are. That sounds great. Yes. Fabulous Martha Chavez. Welcome to Comedy Nerd. Comment ça va? Ça va bien, toi? Ça va bien. Tu fais le, le blague en français maintenant. Oui. Eh Mar- bien, ça. Martha Chavez, I cannot believe you speak. I, for the first time, I've known you 20 years, I think. I found out you speak French and Italian. Si. Yeah. And Spanish, of course. And Spanish, of and course. English. But you know, my favorite is English. Mm. Is that, is it is the, maybe the, I wonder sometimes, do you wonder sometimes in which language do you think? Well, I, I find I very clearly think in English, but whenever I'm thinking in French and dreaming in French, I'm much happier. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, see, you prefer English, I prefer French. That's my, that is my you absolute dream, favorite language. And then you do dream in French? I, I, when I, I have spent long periods of time in France, when I'm in France and only speaking French, I do dream in, uh, in French. I wonder if I can turn your volume, you can turn your volume up, Martha. Okay, just a second, maybe. Okay, here in a box, we will Nicaragua. That's the way that Linda says. Now, (laughs) because uh, we Nicaragua and everything. (laughs) I get it. In Nicaragua, if you don't have something, you use whatever you have because uh, you don't, like what I don't know now, maybe it's different, but when I was growing up, they, whatever, like if the antenna of the television didn't work, you will get a hanger and try to fix it. Oh, I've, I've always been a total master with that. And I think yeah. I never felt it was politically correct to say it's it's the ghetto girl in me, but my dad coming from Haiti... And yeah. being a, in a place, I, I experienced this in Kenya too, where if, if you don't have a lot of money, you do find solutions and you end up being very creative. Like we had, we had a radiator that leaked and my dad would just pull over every couple of miles. We'd fill it with three bottles of water, uh, mm-hmm. apple juice water g- containers. And then, uh, and then we'd move on. My, my sister vomited out the window. My dad didn't even stop. He was like, we got to we, we're driving and we'll clean up at the next gas station. <laughs> Yes, I'm glad to be here, part of your, of your fabulous podcast. I've, I've always been an admirer and a stan and a fan of uh, Rachel Rachel. Oh, merci. Yeah, all, all of your, your one-person shows, your comedy, everything. It's nice to be here. Thank you. So, so a few of the, there's, there's so many things I want to talk to you about, but I think just to start with, having grown up in Nicaragua, and then mm-hmm. ending up in Montreal, taking translation courses, and then taking a class with Andy Nullman, a stand-up comedy class. How? What? What happened in between that? Like, what? Who were you in Nicaragua? Who was Martha there? And then, how did you end up in Montreal and end up doing stand-up comedy? Well, in Nicaragua, I'm gonna tell you, I was. Uh, I came here very young, on my own, even not with my family or anything like that. But in Nicaragua, I was, let's say, uh, my family was well off, let's not rich, but my pa- <clears throat> both my parents were professionals. We were raised uh, in Catholic private schools and everything. But there was always some instability 
in the country, be it because of natural disasters. Uh, we had the earthquake in 72 when I was seven. Where then mm -hmm. the revolution started. My parents had the jobs at the government, like many people did. But, but uh, I mean, it was a dictatorship. So whether they uh, they participated or not with um, with the ideas or anything, because it didn't. <clears throat> you know what I mean? You just get a job in the government, and then uh, by, by the time that the that the revolution succeeded, they had been off their government in a long time. But mm. it was all this instability. One day you are, you have uh, something, the next day we lost everything in the earthquake. Mm. Then, <clears throat> then my family lost everything in the, um, the revolution and had to move to Guatemala. I was here. So in Nicaragua, let's say it was a very pampered, in a way, existence in comparison to the other, to the great majority of Nicaraguans. But in another way, it was very unstable. And uh, I kind of like always knew that, that something was going to happen. You know, I kind of I always had my ear in everything that was happening it, without internet. I, I was an avid reader since I was little mm. because I was chunky. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, chunky, like my brothers and sisters, they all, they all had championships of swimming, of this and that, and I was embarrassed. <laughs> like I was a chunky chick all mm. my life. I, I have I have had these uh, weight issues. And I think I was already, I already had the knowledge that I was gay. So, so I, uh, I don't know, I must have had something. Maybe, I, I, don't, I don't even know if, if like in those days they didn't examine children, whether you were on the spectrum or were not on the spectrum, mm. but I was a peculiar child. Later on in life, I got a diagnosis of uh, ADHD, but I remember that I spent long, long time by myself painting in my room, reading, and then by the time I was 14, the rebellion. And uh, and and then my they they my parents didn't want me to get involved in the revolution like many children that went to those Catholic school mm. were because the revolution is true it was a revolution of uh, of the people but it was all or orchestrated by the children of the bourgeoisie that went abroad and and it was in uh, 1969 when they started mm. and all of these social movements happening in the states they came back to Nicaragua. You know, with uh, with ideas and, and, mm. and means to move people. You, you mentioned the, your rebellion time and also a rebellion in your own country right before that, because you said you were watching, uh, you were painting, you were reading a lot of books, and I've heard yeah. you say that there are certain stand-ups that were influenced by, but not necessarily at an early age. So, what were you? Did you have a TV? Were you watching TV? Were you watching comedy at all, or reading anything oh, funny? I like was, was I was? I always been like. Unfortunately, it is true that I have been a, a big reader, but I always been a TV addict. But it, but we had two channels. Two. Yeah. We had two channels in those days. Yeah. Same with and me. At Eleven o'clock. They, they played the national anthem, and it was finished. But my parents were. They, they had all of these friends that came and talked, and um, I always put, I was with my ear to what the adults were saying. My mother admired humor, incredible. Whenever I said something, she would call friends. She would call friends. Look, look what she said. <laughs> look what she said. Like I was, I was celebrated yeah. by my witticisms. That was the only thing my mother celebrated, mm -hmm. and I loved to read the uh, Spanish satire, like from Spain. Mm. This guy, his name was Jardiel uh, Poncela, like books that were uh, satire, theater. I was involved in theater, in the, mm. in the, burla, in the, in the theater that the nuns allowed. <clears throat> I remember I, I had I had a, a part in a in a play of the the, cam, the Cameron mm. in, in those <laughs> days, you know. So I was, but I didn't know stand up. We didn't know stand up comedy in those days. Like the comics that we knew that that were mostly Mexican. His name was Cantinflas, and later on I found out that he may have been a ripoff oh. of Charlie Chaplin. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah, because he was the same, you know, the Trump. He spoke in malapropisms. I remember that we may have seen Carol Burnett. In in Spanish. And for me, she was just a crazy lady who did this a lot, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> Made funny movements with but, her uh, mouth. I, was, I, lo I always loved humor, humor shows in Spanish. They were mostly from Mexico. 
Mm. But I, but but like a, a person that stands up and tells jokes, only only people that told jokes from the street, street mm. jokes. Well, it's yeah. interesting that your mom was constantly getting you to kind of entertain people. Like yes, you're not you're not the first comedian that's told. Like I was, my brother did that to me. He was always poking me to go and make people laugh. But many of us comedians had someone who was kind of our pusher. Yeah, and and my, I remember my father hate, hated vulgarity. Mm. Like he would never, like he would never stand a joke that was not even little, a little bit blue from mm. his friends or, or even from my mother. But my mother liked liked a lot uh, humor, and and she was really funny. She was really funny, maybe not even on purpose. But when when she, my mother was a lawyer, when she told you she worked outside the house. When she came back home and she told you stories about her co-workers or anything, she would make their faces. <laughs> she would be like, like, you know, she. I still, I, I hope that I can restore some uh, all the VH, VHS mm. tapes from my mother making face, telling a story about going to the um, pedicurist. <sighs> and then that the women at the pedicurist were ah, ah, yelling as if they were having an orgasm, but she wouldn't use that <sighs> word. Oh, so, you know, like I, see, my mother was was really funny, not intentionally. You were saying when you turned for fourteen, things really shifted for you, and you oh, kind yeah, of things, discovered a sort of rebelliousness in yourself. Yeah, things shifted for me because they, okay, so the the nuns they started bringing us to the slums of Nicaragua to uh, to teach uh, literacy, to teach people to read. And to see, I don't know, have you been in Haiti? I have many you times, know? yeah. I mean, to see, it, like, these are things, like, there is two, two Haitis to Nicaragua. So, yeah, when you see that, it's something that starts, like, stirring inside of you. Mm. And um, and then if you express it at home, you're, you're, my mother had this obsession with communism. Mm. It's like it's like if she lived the McCarthyism era or she was influenced for that, she was everything... She was obsessed with communism, so you 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 couldn't tell her anything. Oh, those communists! The mm. nuns are communists, and all of her. <laughs> she had this obsession. If you if you borrow her her brush, I hate international communism. She would say. <laughs> she didn't want you to lend you her brush. That was that was communist. I don't know what it was. I think that it may have been that the dictator family was in power when she was growing up too, and they because they were puppets of the the United States, they brought that to the culture. The co everything that was not them would translate to communism, and, and we are still there. We are still there. Anything, any. Imagine that some people are saying that Justin Trudeau is communist, mm, mm. or that Hillary Clinton is communist. Like they are corporate people, no much different from their their conservative counterparts. Mm -hmm. It's just this fear. So I knew that I couldn't say anything at home, and uh, and I started really because when you're 15 years old. They introduce you. It's like the ball, you know. Like they introduce. You start. You start mingling with boys. I went to an old girl Catholic mm. school. I didn't go with boys. Mm. So when they asked me, "Were you the class clown?" I wasn't because there was not that dichotomy. Yes. Yes. Although there was like girls didn't were not class class clowns. Although I was always in trouble. I always talked too much. I was always at the at the <laughs> like you know I, conductor, conduct zero. <laughs> Like, you know, like, and now I realize why. Mm. Like, I had ADD, you know, and, I, mm. and um, so then I started the, the rebellion, and <clears throat> I started also notice I didn't want this story that they would mingle us with boys or anything like that. Now, in hindsight, I am happy, you know, in spite that it's been very hard for me to feel uprooted, to feel like I've I always been alone. My family never came here. What is a brutal? A, uprooted from your culture, you know, or to have been, to have been, because I, when I was sent here to Canada, I wasn't sent to stay forever, mm. but because oh, everything changed and then I stay on my own. I became a political refugee on my own. 
And um, but I have always had that chunk missing mm. in my soul. You know, the, your culture, your family. I wish that I would have had family connections to help me in my career or or, or, or things like that. Fortunately, I have had angels all of my life. The only, you know, my cousin. That's my only family that I have, Maria Amanda. Yeah. But I, I didn't, I wasn't in touch with her until 2005 because I was hiding from family that I was getting. Mm. Well, well, how old were you when you left Nicaragua? Seven, sixteen, and sixteen, then, sixteen. And when my parents told me they couldn't support me anymore, I was already seventeen and in immigration limbo here because my student visa ran out and I couldn't go back to Nicaragua since my fa my family had to escape mm. and I couldn't uh, go back to Guatemala because I had no papers. So because I was babysitting for this Jewish lawyer, he said that I he said to me that I I was a classic case of, of a person that could be a candidate for political refugee status okay. and sent me to another lawyer, a human rights lawyer in, in uh, Julius Gray, mm. which Julius Gray, who was actually the one who was the lawyer of, uh, of uh, Mike Ward. Oh, you're kidding. Recently, yeah, yeah, Julius Gray, and he helped me the steps for uh, applying for political refugee status. But in the meantime, I meet Giovanna, my Italian girlfriend. Mm. So I start living with Giovanna, like, uh, like you know. So this um, is why you speak Italian. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the exactly. language of love. The lessons of love. And she was Italian from from Italy, like, all, all, uh, like, like exactly like me. Her family living in Rome. My family living, and in those this was the eighties already. And in, in those days, you know that coming out of the closet to you, to you, to oneself is um is in a slow. Uh, at, at least for me, that's what it was because of uh, family things. Like I never w went out with guys or anything like that. But I um I remember that at the beginning I could say, well. I am not a lesbian. I just love the person. Yes, of course. <laughs> but it just so happened that all the people I love. <laughs> you know what I mean? It it's just me the like human, that. but they happen to all be women. You know, every <laughs> relationship I've ever had. Exactly. It's all be, you know, it's, But it's like you come out little by little. I remember the liberation that I felt hmm. uh, when I first went to a gay bar. Mm. In Montreal, Gillies, being when I first could hold the hand mm. and be hugging the person I was with because mm. I was in Nicaragua that was on her on her off. I think that I would have died if I had stayed there. I think that I and, and had to conform to get to marry some guy that I was going to make, make very unhappy. Mm. It would have been, I, I, I don't know, I, I don't think that I would have survived. Uh, the revolution was going on and my sister and I were smoking pot. Like from 14, 15 going out, like uh, something was happening outside, but we, we were kind of oblivious in a mm. way since we couldn't join. But I was sent to Canada in order for me not to, to get brainwashed by the communist. <laughs> the nuns. But uh, they, 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 well, and there is another story, but I don't want to get into it. But uh, the thing is that when, once that I was here, and then my parents go to in exile to Guatemala, and uh, they uh, never wanted to come here because what were they going to do? They didn't speak English. They didn't, whereas in Guatemala, they could work as paralegals, basically. They couldn't work as lawyers anymore, but on their, they could work for lawyers and do, you know, paralegals. Mm -hmm. And my mm -hmm. mother, at 65, my mother got her degree again. She worked, my mother was, uh, it's a, my mother was an incredible woman, even if we didn't get along. <laughs> Mm. because we did it but uh and how did she feel about you eventually going into comedy what was her opinion on that oh how come i don't see you on Seinfeld? of course oh my god i just i was on a podcast three days ago and i said they said oh you're a bit of a, a dirty comic and i said uh has and they said has anyone ever told you oh you should clean up your comedy my dad every day would say to me why can't you be more like seinfeld I basically started doing stand-up seriously after my dad died because I was like, I can't do Seinfeld are humor. Are you a dirty comic? I never thought you were. Well, no, I talk about sex, so I'm considered dirty. I'm considered dirty because I talk about my vagina a lot. I talk about sex. So, you know, I, I'm not necessarily, in French, I guess they say cru, 
which means, True, right? yeah. you know, you know and, and it's not the not. same. It's not crude, but I think it's like, you know, Mike Ward is a, cru a comic crew in that you say you're right. a bit risque and out there and kind of saying things you're not really supposed to say. Oh, what do they, the sons say about uh, your children? Oh, they love it. But they saw me as an old 80-year-old, eight, a uh, 60-year-old toothless man for eight years. So this is nothing. <laughs> But so you well, said your your mom did, does well, your mom no, still daughter, say to you oh you, you know Seinfeld Seinfeld or has she kind of gotten off that bandwagon? No, she didn't speak English. I don't understand. You know, like I remember the first time I was on TV, she didn't speak English, but I bring it. But I am. It was my comics episode, mm. you know, filmed in a beautiful stage and everything, mm -hmm. and I put it on to her. Nothing. Oh. Nothing. I don't know what she would say after, like before she died, and all that. She say how proud she was of me. But I don't. I don't even think my mother ever thought the titanic effort that it mm. took for a person like me to arrive to that. Mm. You know, like uh, it's, it's like people don't, don't. People always sometimes people see you for what you don't have, not mm. for what you have. Like uh, like my my brothers now. Why aren't you in Comedy Central? Why haven't you mm. had a, um, a Netflix special? It's a, it's instead of focusing in what I have actually had. Yes, of course. But I saw you did a set in Spanish on JFL. Did anyone yeah. in your family get to see that? Yeah, they saw that. They liked that. It, it, was, a, it was a Spanglish show. It was Spanish English. Yeah. Because I would think that would make you a bit of a rock star with your relatives because they can suddenly yeah. understand you. Like maybe if your mom had heard your set in Spanish, I wonder if she would have had a different opinion. Oh, yeah. Well, no. And then they saw me with the movie with Denzel Washington. And I played the, the, the welfare mother that doesn't speak English. Yeah. I have a scene with fucking Denzel Washington. And what does my mother say? When are you going to be staring your own movie? Oh. <laughs> as, if, as, if oh. it, as if it was easy you know so yeah at one point i just thought whatever you have yeah to things for me yeah. but i wonder sometimes that little voice that tells you that tells all of us oh by this time in my life i should have something more significant and then uh, i have to remind myself I have mm -hmm. to remind myself that it's, it is not easy to do comedy in a second language. It's not easy in a first language. Not easy, it's not even easy. And, and I have to, to have remain up to here because uh, you have to remain relevant uh, even, even if, you, if you're older, even, if, you know, like that fight, mm -hmm. uh, that, that fight that is always present. You know, like, uh, and then you think, oh, I should have had a, a, a Netflix special. But in my shoes are who knows how many comics that are out there that we don't see because they don't get to, to, to get those shows. We only see a certain group of people. Yeah, well, I wanted to ask you about that, too, because I think I'm curious about how you approach the business of comedy, because I think in Canada, there's probably like 25 things you can do to say to show that you've you've gotten somewhere in Canada and I'd say you've done all of those things you've done all the festivals you've done just for laughs you've done the Halifax Comedy Festival you've done CBC the debaters you had your comic special do you approach your work in a very business way because it seems like you have the business side it, my impression is you have your shit together and that you're a businesswoman not only are you funny you're very very savvy with business or I may be just thinking that not knowing whether it's true or not he's not true Oh, no. no, it is true. It is true. I have, I have, a, I always work. It's like you, you're always working in something. Mm. Like whenever I feel that I'm like, like, like now with the pandemic, that, uh, that I am lacking, I'm just out there like writing, refining, watching, you know, that I taped all of my shows since the beginning of my career. I have tops of VHS that I haven't been able to use or watch. Even, but I am, I don't know what I have in my head. One day I'm gonna watch them and I'm gonna find material that I may use now. Like I, I even have a machine to do it, I haven't done it. But I, um, I, I, I have to keep busy. Although this time with the pandemic, it did cross my mind, what are we gonna do if we never go back to, to performing? Mm. Uh, I should, there are, there are a lot of, I should have, 
Mm. In my career, I should have sent a package to 22 minutes. I should have mm. uh, shown a, a writing sample to mm. to the to you know to the Baroness Bond sketch. Mm. I should have. I should have. Yes. Things that you didn't do. It's very hard not to do that. But the thing is, it's it's funny getting back to the that you tape your sets because I've always known that about you and I think most people in who have met you in the industry know. know that you tape yes. your sets do you humongous camera oh yeah and do you look at these l let's delve a little bit into your process of first of all you have the impulse to tape it do you review all of your tapes and take notes like what's your creative writing process yeah, or developing I mean, material and all of that. I, at the beginning of my career in 1994, I was obsessed with pronouncing well because uh, a lot of other comics, you know how it is, a lot of uh, people told me, oh, you, they're going to think you're stupid. I was I was obsessed with the good pronunciation. I wrote every <laughs> word that I would say. And this happened like maybe for ten years. So I would I would tape record first with with a you know like a, one of those long recorders that you with a long cassette. <laughs> And I the old hear. the old camera that had the VHS in it. Yes. Oh, I, I had I had so That's many. Awesome. Look at the, the in this furniture. They 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 are still here. The thing is that I taped because I noticed when I first tape that I did recording that I did that I thought I had said something, but I hadn't said that. And, mm. and then I wonder why the joke didn't work. And it was because in my head I, I have verbalized verbalized this, but it, I had said something else. So then I started the habit of taping and, and you know detaching, because you you know how how obsessed one can be with oneself. Oh look, I look fat. I look this. I look that. Mm. And uh, detaching myself and uh, and then watching the tape as if I were a director. Mm. So okay, so I did this many times. Then I will write in a little notebook. Mm. The next day before performing, I do not touch my hair. <laughs> you know what? I, and then when I said something that it was not true, I would do this. And oh. I would not touch my nose. <laughs> Like, or like I, I leave my face alone. Like, you know, I gave in instructions to me at the beginning and I would follow word by word the sets that I wrote. Mm. Then with the years, now I mostly tape because that's the way I'm writing. <clears throat> I have an idea. I said that, oh, you know, I saw this comic that pretends that has an accent and is very successful. And uh, and they pretend that uh, they don't have the accent, but they pretend, and and they don't care if they say if they, if they whatever if they sound like idiots or whatever. So I thought I should follow this person and not to be so obsessed with the with the order of the words and everything. But then I I also became very studious mm. about comedy, about about comedy formulas, about um, being brief. In, in, the, in the, you know, arriving to the punchline mm -hmm. before before that telling a story to go punchline and punchline and punchline and big punchline. Mm -hmm. I took a workshop. I, I spent so much money, the money that I didn't have in this career. I went to New York City and to take this workshop with this guy for $90, half an hour. <laughs> and then, uh, then When I was this, Martha? How old were you when you did this? This is 1998. Oh, so right when, is this after you had taken a course with Andy Nelman in Montreal? Yeah, I took courses with Andy Nelman, with Mike Nemiroff, with uh, Judy Carter. Yeah, I with Judy, like they, her, Judy, I brought her to Montreal, Judy Carter. Oh, wow. She wrote form. the comedy Bible. She's Yeah, 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 yeah because, because like, like uh, maybe it's not the style now. I don't know if the young kids are learning with that, but I think those are the building blocks. Oh, absolutely. They yeah. of, of, of comedy and then you, you do whatever you want with it. I think that you have to learn uh, some formulas. Because it's, it's not that it's just going to come in your head just like that. You have to have a point. You have to deliver the point. You have to have a punchline. Punchlines are queens. The punchline is the, the, the queen, be it physical, be it whatever it is, you have to have it. So this professor the, in New York City, he said, you have to talk in punchlines. Mm. He said to me, and for you, it's not difficult 
because you sound funny. <laughs> you get <that> meaning. You, <laughs> you are a punchline. <laughs> no, you are a punchline. So, so then I thought, yeah. So then when I started writing more stories, because I now say, I, I have now more to tell a long story. It has to be little punchlines, little punchline, big punchline. And that's how I write. I watch it on, on the video and then I add. And now that I have Linda Bradbeer, my only Anglo girlfriend that I have ever had, and she knows comedy. You, my comedy has become so much better because of oh. Linda. Yeah. She tells me, no, she tells me, say this word, and, and it, it has helped. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, have you worked with writers ever before, Martha? To write for me? People writing for you? I, wrote, I, I work with Kenny, Kenny Robinson. Oh, okay. So no, he would help you a bit with writing. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, he would tutor me. In writer, he helped me write one of my best jokes that I don't do anymore, uh, but because I, I some woman came to yell at me. <laughs> it is uh, I grew up during a revolution. It was tough in my high school yearbook. I was voted most likely to talk under torture. <laughs> 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 uh, but previous to that, I have been speaking how much I talk is that I am a blabbermouth so mm. so the joke is not about torture yeah. it's about me I would yeah. laugh immediately I spill the beans because oh it's I a talk. great joke and yeah but some woman waited for me you know or some woman from Argentina waited for me after nothing show funny she, about torture she said what is it funny about torture oh. I don't think it's anything funny I am triggered because I was tortured so I, I retired it for a little while. I retired the joke, but I wrote that one with Kenny. Kenny Kenny was uh, really supportive at the beginning, although our styles are totally different. But I I I, uh, I owe to Kenny many things mm. because it, it's just like a domino. I was in Montreal. My neighbor Shahid was a, as a was a VJ in much music and Shahid tells me, you know, there is an urban review, an urban comedy coming to town. They're going to be playing at the at Club Soda, which now is Cola Note Club Soda. Mm. Uh, 900 people, they will be there. Do you want to do a spot? And I go, well, can you get me a spot? And he goes, yeah. And then uh, it was Kenny's show. It was the Nubian show in Montreal. That's awesome. So I, go, I go and I do the Nubian show and I kill, destroy, that I thought, I'm not this funny. Yeah. I said, Why are you, <laughs> what is it? But it was 900 black people that they express. They oh. express uh, <laughs> like when you perform for the Nubians. Yeah. The, the urban show, they, it's, it's a lot. It's the, they express if they like you, and if they hate you, they'll boo your ass. But I destroyed them then. Well, and that was in the 90s too? 98. Okay, yeah, because that was like, it's like the uh, deaf comedy jam. People listening all over the world could relate to that Nubian Disciples was like the our, our Canadian deaf comedy jam, and it still is going. Yeah, and then, no, but the thing is that then, then Kenny invites me to do the Nubian in Toronto. When Toronto was like another country, I remember I came with Freddie James. I don't know if you know Freddie James from Montreal. Yes, He's I've heard singer. of him. He's a soul singer too. I don't know if he does comedy, but but uh, so I come with Freddie James, and it seems such a long drive just to do the Nubian for for the evening. And then Mark Breslin mm. was on the show, and he he called me, and he said to me that he that he thought that I would be a superstar. He said like Kathy and Jimmy, and I go, who? And he says Kathy and Jimmy. The fat nun in Sister Act, remember her? <laughs> You're but like, I thank you. I didn't think sort it Sort of. Bad. I didn't think it as bad. And then in another movie, and then he said to me, because in Montreal, that was a, well, when we started Montreal, is doing, doing uh, in those days, it was only me and Heidi as mm. women. So, of course, I progressed very quickly in my career mm. because, because they needed me. And Ernie Butler liked me, so he would take me, he, they would take you to do shows, but you were still an opener. Mm. So, at the beginning, I said, like, I just want to be, to go uh, to Ontario to middle. Mm. I would I, I would showcase for Howie, and Howie, you know, he was always, you're not ready, you're not ready. And then, then uh, I, I showcase, I, I didn't showcase for Mark, I just did the Nubian in Toronto, and I killed, and then Mark called me, and he said, we have to sign you, he said. Mm. 
And I go, oh, yeah, I, I, I will mind if I uh, do a split middle. No, no, no. You will do the middle. And immediately they signed me at Yak Yaks. Mm. And then in another movie, and, and I had laryngitis. I remember, but I still did the show. And I did well. <laughs> and Joe Bodolite, may he rest in peace, was there. And he invited me to do the comics episode. This is in two years of performing. I wasn't absolutely ready to do it. But what was I going to say? No. But then not, wouldn't you say the 90s in Toronto, there was a TV boom too. There, were, there was like... She's so funny. There was oh, adventures yeah, yeah, yeah. in comedy. There was the comics. It yeah. seemed like there were a lot of, there were just for laughs shows. There, there were a yeah. lot of opportunities for young comics. But and that's then, cool to hear that you, I didn't know how you had ended up with Yak Yaks. So it's interesting to hear how you very early on ended up on their roster and, and working and, and, with you them. You know, it was so, um, now that I think about it, like in retrospect, it was so nerve wracking because all we have heard about Ontario was you have to play with the big boys. You have to go on tour with the big boys. People there, it's not like in Montreal. We are very cocoon here and protected in Montreal. So, so you know, like before a show, I would like study, you know, everything that I had to say. And I had some people, let's say in Windsor, in, mm -hmm. in the rough, uh, not that I'm saying that Windsor is rough, but it, it was a border town in the in the places that was um that was more difficult i would have reports from uh, the club owners that people didn't understand the way i talk and mark could have said to me well i'm not booking you but mm. mark always gave me the opportunity this is just to say that i cut my teeth in real rooms no mm. safe rooms nothing mm. i had to learn on my toes, but because I was very disciplined, studious about comedy. Like, uh, for example, whenever I went on the road and, and I was meeting for people, I would watch the four nights of the show. I would watch, uh, even if I knew their act inside out, I would watch the four nights mm -hmm. of the show because I knew, uh, just to learn, you know, the nuances, the spontaneous bullshit that is not spontaneous. In comedy, the, 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 the way that, that you are present on stage and related to relating to that particular crowd, different crowds every night, and, that, mm. and I will take notes. See, and I will, be, I will be even obnoxious, asking people uh, advice. And, and, and remember, I was a woman, but I never thought about those things. Mm. I never thought, oh, they're not going to like me because I'm a woman. I never thought that. All I wanted was to to do the task at hand, mm. to do if I was openings, if I was middling, just to concentrate on that, no matter who who was before or after me. I remember in Montreal, some people wanted to scare me because sometimes when you're new, people want to scare you. Mm. Oh, you're going on first, you're going bullet. And I, they say, and then I, I, I did those were the, the times that I used to meditate a lot. So I, I would write in my little notebook where I gave myself instructions. I find them. Hmm. I have tops of those little <laughs> notebooks too. I find them. No matter what place you are in the lineup, you will just do you. You mm. will. Like, because, affirmations. Because it's affirmations. Yeah. Because anything can, that's the thing with the stand-up. It's like a walking the tightrope. Anything mm. can happen. And, it, it, and that's one of the things that I love the most. Anything can happen. I don't want to be cocooned. I want, I want the excitement of, of, of like, you know, winning this crowd over. Mm. And, uh, and then I, I would ask to, be, to go on first. So I would take away that fear. I would say, can you please put me on first? Mm -hmm. I would I would ask the people to, to go on first. And in reality, first or no first, maybe when you are showcasing for a, for a festival is not the best uh, spot because the warmer the audience is and the higher you are, like number three, four, five, six mm -hmm. in the in the lineup is, is what... Uh, oh, yeah, what you always is. hope you're going to be on at least fourth. Third yeah, or fourth, I find, sweet spot. Yeah, but if you have, if you are first and you do a kick-ass mm. energy and you open and you set up that show, well, it, it can be, it can work for you too. It's, it's, mm. that's, that's another thing. 
you can you can control what you can control. Mm. At the moment, for example, I was terrified. Like we, I have always been terrified. Oh, the only thing that has that has scared me is not to work and then lose my jobs because you acquire these jobs. I, I am fe- I acquire to be fearless, 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 fearless. And then uh, the the pandemic comes. And uh, what, I perform twice a month Mm -hmm. when I'm used to do rooms, I'm used to do this, I'm used to do that, besides Mm -hmm. my work as a stand-up. But we adapted really well. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, it's interesting what you were saying, going back a little bit on being a woman in comedy in the 90s and that you didn't think of yourself as a woman you were just like i'm a comedian i'm i'm doing my job and i want to i want to do great and i couldn't help but wonder how you feel now 20 years later because i know you're part of for instance when feminists rule the world that's one of the podcasts that you're involved in i know you're called a you've called yourself an activist and yeah. you've you said you're the LGBTQ Nicar most famous LGBTQ Nicaragua yeah, Canadian right, stand-up because, comedian okay. in the world. What what, what I said? No, I, I I was aware because of reading about it, because of reading uh, about it, reading books by Whoopi Goldberg by by Margaret. Cho, I was aware that there is a bias mm. in comedy against women. But uh, what what I mean is, I didn't let me let that stop me. I just I just I just thought I just have to do this job. I just have to entertain this crowd, and I would I would let's say sometimes I would like kill. And then the guy the the guy that dropped me, usually a guy to the to the gig, would try to put me down. You know, like I would try to oh because maybe I did better than him. Mm. Then I would take. You know, like I would absorb it. I would maybe answer, but I would absorb it. Oh, they just laugh because you, you, you talk funny because of the accent. Mm. And then I thought, when I saw that comedian that pretends to have an accent and has had a great career with it, I thought, well, if they only laugh at the accent, more power to me. Mm. You know, like uh, and um, and uh, and and I have had. I don't know if you have had women that come and tell you. You know what? I don't like women comedian. Yeah. But I like you. Yeah. And they think that you're going to feel great. Oh, about- all the time. And I think <laughs> even getting more specific with what I was asking, I think when I did comedy in the 90s, there was a part of me when I went to the basement of Yak Yaks and I felt like it was a very male oriented atmosphere and it was very I can understand why women wouldn't do comedy at that time for me that inspired me because I thought I have to do comedy as a woman just so that women can hear their own voices when I came back into comedy after taking a break and doing one woman shows and coming back in 2011 I did feel like the environment had changed for women that it wasn't such a misogynistic environment and that there were so many more women doing comedy so it kind of settled a bit but that saying I do still think that I I guess what I'm saying is from looking at the work that you're doing and calling yourself a feminist and saying, I am a feminist, I align myself with feminists. I think I act like a feminist, but I never, I don't really call myself, I I don't have an opportunity often to say I am a feminist. And yet I feel like sometimes the very act of speaking in public in front of people and being a woman is feminist. That's what feminism is. It's not that you will have to speak about feminist issues, but it's just that as a human being with a place in society. Mm. Because the division is, oh, feminists hate men. No, feminists just want not only a place at the table by cooking the food, but also by eating it and by speaking about it. Mm. You know, like I, um, I didn't choose the name of the podcast. It's worked with the Nobel Women's Initiative. They chose the name and it's, they, it's a tongue-in-cheek name because I said, when feminists rule the world, but is it, isn't that like a, the opposite of patriarchy? We don't want to rule the world. We want equality. Mm-hmm. But if women rule the world, maybe things will go better. Well, yeah, it's a, as you said, it's a play on words. It's like a, <laughs> a woman I know wrote a show called uh, If God Were a Woman. And it's just, it's playing with the idea of like, it may seem ridiculous, but why is it not ridiculous that a man is God? Like, it, it's just, it really is a play on words. It is a play on words. And then and then, uh, then I realized, you know, like uh, in my whole career, I realized because with the awareness that the young women comics are bringing to the table, 
they have um, raised awareness in me about things that I have lived and I didn't even know that I lived them. Like, you know, a comic touching your boob, uh, some <laughs> lewd commentary, or what do you do with your girlfriend, stuff like that. I didn't think it was, how would I say, it made me uncomfortable. Mm. But I just wanted to be one of the guys, you know, they are vulgar. I uh, I accept vulgarity because I didn't want to protest in the sense of like, you know, c comrades. And because they knew that since I was gay, that they knew they wouldn't go anywhere with me. But that, does, that doesn't take away that you pinched my ass. That, that You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Things have completely changed. The foundations have been shaken. Mm. And uh, some people are not liking it, but I, I, I do like the approach that the young girls have. Mm. The only thing is that I, I feel that, uh, yes, safe rooms are necessary, but the world at large is not a safe room. When you say safe rooms, safe rooms for comedy? For comedy, because they advertise it's a safe room. Yeah, I know there's a lot of safe rooms in Toronto. Um, I've, I've talked to some other comics about it. I, I it, honestly, if, if I'm honest, I feel like what you just said about comedy not being safe. People can do what they want. People can have uh, all women shows or have a safe show or have, um, I, I, I don't know. I've always, it, this is something in myself is I always like diversity and even diversity in like when it's an all women's show, it always makes me a little bit uncomfortable saying men can't come. Like if there's a guy that you happen to like, he can't be on the bill because it's an all women's show. I personally have always just loved having many different types of people on a show and never saying, well, it's going to be all of these types of people. And again, with a safe room i understand why people would do that and i respect the fact that people would say this is how i want to do comedy this is the the atmosphere i want to create i just find myself i'm always terrible in those situations like i went to a safe room in toronto and and was i was very inappropriate i was not safe in i i was i did not act in a safe manner to the <laughs> audience but it's because i'm naturally rebellious and if someone uh -huh. says you can't say this you can't joke about rape i'm like well i'm a woman and i'm gonna joke about it and again i shouldn't be doing that at a no rape joke room but that's kind of <laughs> that's my nature and, and again a, did you get it scolded I, well, let's just say I I just know I'm not I would never be welcome back at that room. And this was this was a while ago. This is about eight years ago. But again, I just think I don't know. I, I, I think deciding on someone's rules, like individually as comedians, we all have our own set of rules. And I think that I also have always approached comedy in a little bit of a rebellious way. And if someone's telling me, even if a, a group that has a show is saying you can't do these kind of jokes at that at, at this room it's kind of a room I probably shouldn't go to because I don't like people telling me because if I'm in the room and I I want to joke about something you know I, I feel like I'm a bit of a monster sometimes when I get on stage and that I can tell my monster not to say these things but when they're on stage when I'm on stage I can't tell what's going to happen I can generally but can I tell you that uh that uh the other day I read on Facebook one of these comics um, saying that now you cannot say that's dumb or saying uh, like it's like a situation that is dumb because what was the name what they use or, or say to somebody so say about so oh that's so dumb about any situation because that is what what was the you the name that they use that that's a um, neuro something that superiority and I said to them, well, then you cannot say that to somebody that they are intelligent either. Oh. <laughs> but by the same token. That is ludicrous, that though. Or, it totally is totally ludicrous. It's totally I do. I do understand certain things that uh, I mean, better. we have always been like that. They, the people, people are talking about cancel culture, but. I have yet to do a festival in which I don't submit word by word what I'm going to say. And some guy in the other, especially just for laugh, some guy in the other, in the other end of the, of the communication, you know, vetoes or allows what I'm going to say. No, but so, saying, saying not, don't say something's dumb. Not saying oh, something, yeah. like comedy comes either from anger, from irritation, from frustration, from like to not be able to say my kid is an idiot 
for driving the car through the garage door when he thought it was open. Like for someone to tell me I can't say that is like, yeah. who makes my, like make your own goddamn rules. Like if someone's that specific, go and yeah. do your own comedy and don't say dumb. But trying to control other comedians, like that pisses me off so much that someone would want to tell other comedians. And again, there's probably a lot of young comedians going to those shows and they're gonna think, oh, okay, this is just how comedy works. Some producers yeah. can tell you what to say, what not to say. Like I just spoke exactly. to a French comedian yesterday and she was like amazed at how much our club owners tell us what to do. Cause in Quebec, the club owners do not tell you what to say and what not to say. You you say whatever the fuck you want cause it's your art and it's your exactly. own, your art You form say whatever the profession. fuck you want. And uh, you know that once when I did my comedy now, I did a, a joke about, uh, I did a joke that I had a fight with a taxi driver. The guy was Muslim, and because uh, I know that when I went in the car, he dressed me with his eyes. <laughs> he dressed <laughs> me with his eyes, and I could tell because he had a picture of his seven wives on the dashboard, and they all look alike, and I did like that. And I had about a hundred complaints hmm. that they wrote to, to Sandra Fair, the producer of, of Comedy Now. But then I had to apologize, and it was when the Taliban was um, was the you know like uh, obliterating the statues and burning books mm. and putting women in the full burqa regalia. So I said, well, yeah, I am really so. But they said to me, it's not seven wives; it's four wives mm -hmm. that they have. And then I said, well, it's my ignorance. It was a joke. I'm sorry that I hurt your feelings, but and I hope that you dedicate this letter writing passion to the people of the Taliban mm. that are doing the, the, mm. these, these abominations in Afghanistan and, and all of that, because sometimes we lose, we lose um, a, the vision for little things. Well, and, and also our job, our job is to take topics that are risque and risky and to toe that line of if you can make it funny then you've probably been successful if you have a hundred complaints okay so maybe you're gonna look at that joke a little and some people like we've just talked about mike ward may say fuck it i'm gonna do this joke because i feel it's important and people need to hear it but again yeah. i don't think many comedians are out there trying to insult people, trying to offend people. Often we're trying to understand our world, understand news, understand things happening. And our job as comedians is to try to, you know, it's like the the jester that used to come and try and impress the king. You, you know, you just don't want to get your head chopped off because you can't yeah. getting canceled now is getting your head chopped off. And that's the what you have to, you know, swim through on Twitter now if you want to say something that is honest and coming from you and also, you know, in a way you almost you wish you could have an impact but and yet people almost should probably try not to have an impact like if that's the culture we're going towards of like cancel culture and pc movement it's in a way we're encouraging people not to be impactful because yeah. something that's going to have an impact is going to insult some people oh yeah you know that i don't go ever since trump left i had since the 6th of january when i saw that nothing happened to those people hmm. i decided I'm, i don't want to know anything more Mm. I want to be off the news of the United States because bad people are winning. I don't want to have beefs with people on Twitter. It is so negative. And mm. although it is a good tool to promote uh, whatever we are doing, mm -hmm. I am not in the mood to spend the whole day mm. having a fight with somebody. Of course. And another thing is that you, you, you do your joke. You write a craft, you craft a joke on Twitter and they steal it. Mm. willy-nilly they still they they put it in a meme you know what i mean mm. so it's either it's either i just i just retweet or i just put whatever uh, when i because news or whatever but I'm, I'm not anymore into the fights in twitter i do think that that we are exaggerating when we say cancel culture in comedy because before as george carlin said we couldn't say shit yeah. You know, when, when he said the seven words that you cannot yeah. say, or tell it, yeah. we could not say, literally, you could not say shit. Mm. And uh, and they came in and threw in jail Lenny Bruce mm. for uh, for saying fuck and all of that. I think the cancel culture is uh, is good in a way. So people take, uh, it's, 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 I mean, not cancel culture, but but the, the, the fact that you can call people on their bullshit. Mm.
really want to ask you about yeah. Chunky Salsa, your new CD that you created. Was it a year and a half ago? It was on 2019. Thank God, Rachel. You know, yes. imagine after already 25 years or, or so doing comedy, I only have put one album and now that one other one that is coming up mm. um, that I just recorded with uh, with uh, Howl and Roe. Oh, yes. And, but you should have been putting albums, but, but in retrospect, thank God I didn't because I said a lot of things. Yes. In the past that I, I'm not proud to have said, like that joke about the seven women in the dashboard, but uh, and, uh, and something about an albino. I feel bad that I said those jokes. <laughs> but uh, Well, I, I'm curious about your process for creating Chunky Salsa because you said it was 20, 20 years in the making. And can you talk a no, little bit about the beginning to the end of like deciding you wanted to create it? And then to actually taping it and what that process was like? Oh, it was it was murder mm. Be, to create it. I mean, not to create it because I had the jokes. I had proven jokes that I wanted to retire. I had um, a lot of that. But it's, it's like I say, I'm better live because I'm interacting and I'm jumping and I'm saying and I, and I can make mistakes and, and all of that. But to edit for an album is um i am very picky so i i had to meet with the guy who taped me like a million times i don't like that you know there mm. would you please take it? it it is it was a uh, expensive but i finally did it and thank god because that has sustained me the, mm -hmm. like uh, the the sound exchange economically in this time of pandemic i couldn't believe mm. why was i why, why was i such a moron mm. idiot uh, that I didn't come up with an album before. Oh, I'm sure. How many uh, nights did you tape for your album? I taped twice, two okay. nights. And instead of doing the same jokes, I did uh, two different shows. Oh, interesting. So, so, you know, I still have some tracks that I didn't use that I may give to Alison to include in this new one. But I want to do a new one. I, I think that I what's happening now is that I think I have to find my voice again. You know, that I, I, I do believe that we have a lot of voices inside us. And uh, the Marta that was talking then it is still the Marta that talks now, but now with this experience, this common, common experience that we had about the pandemic and everything, I think that you have to, I have to find my voice again. What do I want to talk about? Because mm. I've been obsessively talking about the, our behavior in the pandemic and all of that. So I think there has to be a renaissance of things that we want to talk about. And also I am older mm. and I have to, like, like when people see you, you are older. It's not well, because I guess you haven't been, you had almost uh, 18 months of not being in the clubs, right? Because Toronto was yeah. really shut down. See, Ottawa kind of stayed open, but yeah, I think I it's, it's interesting. Many comedians during this pandemic have had to just get used to not performing at all. No, well, I, I did do shows in uh, parking lots, in movie theater, in drivings, in, in places like that. Like that's the, that, that's the thing. I did so much love for comedy that wherever, whenever there was a show in the middle of the jungle, uh, we're we gonna do a show. Yes, we're gonna do a show, but it's not at all anymore. I mean, we have to again adapt to people. Mm. And he said, like, to talk to people and with everything that, you, that I have found out about things that I didn't know, but uh, because it did these years of, of reading commentaries on, on Facebook, I realized that, that there is a lot of racism that I didn't actually realize in my whole career. Hmm. And uh, You mean racism wonder, towards you or racism just in general? In general. Hmm. Yes, yeah, so a lot of, of racism in Canada I didn't. I didn't, um, I, there must have been, of course, when I have performed, but they probably saw me like a, like this crazy cleaning lady talking on mm. stage and, uh, and, and they found me cute and they laughed. But now that I know a lot of things, uh, I wonder how that's going to be in the performance. Am I going to be fearless as I was before or am I going to have reservations to go to a little town in southern Ontario? Mm. Am I going to be afraid that now that people are allowed to be openly and brazenly racist mm. and homophobic are going to yell shit at me because to tell you the truth, in, in all of my years on the road, I I have been heckled twice. Mm. Heckled, heckled, uh, I mean, 
directly to insult me mm -hmm. because heckling is uh, is two things is people talking in the crowd people that don't pay attention that i have had but i mean it, it insults towards me only twice mm. and i could navigate them i could survive them if they hurt but i, I could but now that people are, are allowed to be blatantly racist mm. sexist and homophobic because that's the other side of the coin of the political correctness, the, the rebellion of people like, well, you don't want to tell me that I'm not going to insult this older, shorty, chunky woman that speaks, you know, so I wonder how that's going to be. Oh, that's I wonder... interesting. I never thought of that. But that's why, in a way, you like cancel culture is because people are being called out for inappropriateness. No, I do not. I don't, don't get me wrong. I don't like cancel culture. I don't like artists telling other artists what they can or cannot say. Mm. But I do like awareness. There are there is awareness, uh, an awareness in me, for example, that um, that I wouldn't want to insult the Muslim taxi driver mm. anymore because I mm -hmm. have a lot of Muslim friends that I perform with. And because I have had education about the culture and all of that, but what I mean is, is um, a, the people complaining about cancel culture are mostly the people that want to be racist, sexist, and homophobic. Mm. Those are because in reality, but, but there are a lot of young kids that think that yak yaks is a is a nest of patriarchy and, and of rape jokes in the norm of my years. I don't remember people openly doing rape jokes. Mm. I remember guys talking bad about their girlfriends, how stupid they are, or, or your, you know, their mother-in-laws or whatever, but I don't remember. But it, no, and every doesn't... once in a while, a, a really risque comedian would come along, like Aaron Power, really. No, Aaron Berg. He was, uh -huh. you know, he was kind of a wild man of comedy, but yeah. he was he was kind of rare, you know, where you'd see someone who was like really shocking, but he owns that and knows that he's that person. Like, I don't think he is coming from Even a hateful in, place. Uh, Jason Rouse. Jason, Jason Rouse, exactly, when, yeah. But Jason, when he goes and that he screws his grandmother, you know that he's kidding. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Because you know that he's kidding. And, uh, and Aaron, when he talks about being a male stripper and all of that, I have no problem with that. Mm. I have problem when you're insulting my people. Mm. You know, like, uh, be because I always, I wonder, I, I always wonder, you know, why I didn't feel correct when some people say um, the, the word fag or whatever. Why, I always wonder, am I overreacting mm. or whatever? But what I think is is now that there, there, there are a lot more voices in comedy that 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 answer to to that behavior to the behavior of like he's not anymore all white male all white cis male heterosexual mm. if that's the way you say so it is it is an interesting time we are living but i still like you said i don't i don't agree with people telling you what you can and you cannot talk mm. it let it i let it to you and uh, and whatever happened it's like the jester like mm. you say, you just say it in such a way that they don't cut off your head. Yeah, <laughs> that's what you hope for. <laughs> yeah, well, the jester insulted the king, but uh, but uh, but the king didn't know because he said it in such a way that, that yeah, uh, they even be as charming as you can be. That that's kind of a good way, charming as you stab him with your words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Martha, it was so lovely to chat with you, long yeah. overdue. And when do we get to talk for this long, too? We just haven't really had this Never. opportunity. I, I'm just so happy to see this, to see to see you and to hear you and to talk about. I love talking about comedy. Oh, I love it. it's, it's my favorite thing. I have the like I said for me, this was a vocation. Mm. It wasn't a profession. This is like this is what I want to do. Mm. This is a, it's, a, it's like a, before the pandemic, I used to tell Linda, I hope that they kidnap me in Guatemala so I stop this desire of being in a, of being, do, performing comedy every <laughs> night. See, my, my wish was granted. We were kidnapped. But exactly. I have so much. I have needed so much. In fact, I'm signing for the club this weekend. Mm. And I am headlining on the 18th of February, 19th. Fantastic. Uh, Toronto, uh, at half capacity, but it's better than nothing. 
at half capacity and with fears. Because all I'm doing is imagining the saliva. You know, comedy <laughs> is contagious. I am. I speak mostly. They laugh mostly, and in the middle <laughs> there is germs. <laughs> and no more plexiglass, so you have to really be careful. <laughs> and I drink my alcohol because I know that some clothes, some clubs don't give a flying fuck about disinfecting microphones mm. uh, in between. Mm. Yeah, so uh, with all the measurements, we're coming back, though. Mm. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, well, I think everybody's excited to get back. And uh, I look forward to seeing you live very soon. Very soon, Rachel Ellie. Yes. Okay. Thanks, okay, Martha. Yeah, thank you.